Chapter 6. The Fight Hasnaron aimed at the invader's forehead and prepared to release his arrow. He was no stranger to combat, but he was genuinely exhausted. The muscles within his arms struggled to steady his shot as they had done several times earlier that same bloody night. There was a time when he used to keep count of the number of men he had killed using his bow, but that time had passed as he was certain the stacked bodies of his arrowhead victims would reach from here to Alzema, not that he deserved to be there. I have you in my sights, Sasienga, he said, while aligning the arrowhead with the target's helmet. I'd ask for forgiveness, but you probably deserved this arrow filth. He spoke as if the target could somehow hear his words and released his sharpened projectile into the air. Amongst the clashing of swords, screaming of men being scorched by flame, and thud of maces deforming helmets, its otherwise reassuring whistle through the air could not be heard. The distance was comparable to the height of a ship's highest sail mast, and most archers would have never struck their intended prey with such accuracy, but Haz was the atypical arrow launcher. Furthermore, a three-blade broadhead arrow with serrated edges would only be halted by the finest armour available in all of Ereshmar, which the army of Yakvon, fortunately, did not possess. The target's helm was no match for the well-crafted arrowhead with superior density and honed edge. It split its way through metal and bore a cruel hole into the skin and skull. Naz felt little remorse for the scoundrel who had probably murdered several of the Shorelane forces defending the citadel. Much like Sironu and many others, he was nearly flooded with enemy combatants after the first gate opened several minutes earlier, to everyone's astonishment. One of the most important assumptions they made was regarding the gate's security, which had been quickly unlocked. Determining exactly how this happened was no longer a priority, but fighting through the onslaught of enemy fighters was. To his disappointment, there was no sign of feathered abominations, but the number of mace-wielding enemy soldiers was still significant. He removed another arrow from his quiver and aimed at a random enemy. One is as good as another, he thought to himself. His calloused fingers compressed the arrow's knock as he pulled back on the taut string of the bow. He was about to release when he felt a sudden pain across the length of his spine. The bow and arrow hit the floor as Haz collapsed in agony. The muscles and flesh surrounding his vertebrae had been mangled by a well-aimed, spiked mace. The terrible wound inflicted was almost certainly fatal and he thought to himself that he would die with a smile on his face if only he could take at least one more of these Sasayenga with him to Gaheim. He grabbed a final arrow from his quiver, one with a badoon head filled with viscous acid. His attacker straddled him and raised the spiked mace to deliver the coup de grace. Haz saw the opportunity to burst the deadly sphere of Taraku's saliva against his adversary's face. The enemy combatant proved to be too fast for the injured archer, however, and halted his mace's killing swing to deflect Haz's hooking arm. The acid weapon being knocked away and the rapid loss of blood from his open wound removed all hope of Haz's victory over the larger, mace-wielding soldier, who once again raised his spiked weapon. Just as his muscles began to draw the mace downward, the evildoer's chest burst open, sending a shower of blood into Haz's face as an enchanted red spearhead ran through the fiend's thorax. The wounded archer was unsure whether he felt disgust or momentary relief. He decided that the latter was more appropriate and was able to grin despite his imminent death. His beautiful saviour, Eulanea, removed her family's crimson-coloured cutter from the man's back and knelt down before a supine Hasnaron. She held his hand within hers and placed her other hand upon his cheek. 
has. She noticed the pool of blood underneath him was growing quickly. You did well. I lost count of the arrow fletchings raised from corpses littered throughout the hall. So did I, Renlorai, he replied with a chuckle. I'm honoured that you were even counting at all. What number? Did you reach last? She paused for a moment and feigned careful contemplation. One thousand. She shed a single tear as she realised that his wife and her best friend, Nizu Vieira, would never see her valiant husband alive again. No, at least ten thousand for sure, she said. That's still less than half the number of people that won't laugh at my wife's riddles, he replied. She squeezed his hand more tightly. I'll tell her you died well, has Narone. Thank you, Ulania. I'm honoured that last words that I hear will be the sounds of your voice saying my name. No need to tell my wife that. I love her. Has closed his eyes for the last time. She knows, my friend. She's always known. Ren Lorai, we must go now. Despite his subordinate position within the house, Sayaronu pulled Ulanea away from her dead friend and toward the stairwell. Chris ordered his remaining forces to fall back into the Domphala stairwell and close the heavy metal doors behind them. This tertiary barrier was similar to the second and would not be easily breached. But much like Chris, the men knew better than to trust the strength of the doors or the complexity of the locking mechanism as they had before. At best, the door would buy them time to regroup. We're down to only 37 warriors, Tanram. Haz is dead, Marina's is wounded, and the rest of the men are exhausted. Based on the marching force we saw, we will unlikely be able to neutralize another wave of invaders. Orphalus and Freedman might have made it to the port. For all we know, they could be on their way to the keep right now. Do not lose hope. We will fight until we can no longer breathe, Ulanea yelled. Her demeanor had transitioned from lamenting friend to determined Thalavar. Regroup and cup the stairwell bottom. My husband's ancestors designed this place, and our enemies will not occupy it without the toughest fight of their lives. The Donfalar chamber was very large, with a stone floor. Within it stood the statues of Chris's long-departed ancestors with inscriptions of their achievements. Sight within the chamber would have been near impossible if not for the illumination provided by torches. The ceiling was also very high despite its underground location. Upon reaching the bottom of the stairwell, the Thalavar began to organize their final defense. Remaining 17 swordsmen form the first rank. Next rank, nine archers, form the second rank facing the stairwell. Ready arrows! Ulanea yelled. Sayaronu recognized her intended strategy and organized his men. Final rank of eleven Axemen. Protect archers from whatever comes down the spiral. Their armor is weak despite their numbers. Swing for the legs first to Immobilis and then cleave the chest much like in training, he said. You must kill quickly and move on to the next. Chris took a moment to inspire his troops as the men and women began to prepare themselves for the worst. Ready yourselves, men. This is your finest hour. The training you've endured, sharpening of your blades, curving your bows, practicing your aim, pushing your muscles, bones, and heart to the very limit of what they can endure. It comes down to this moment. Although he remained behind the defensive formation, his men knew their Loris was no coward. They had witnessed his feats in battle before, but here, with his daughter, they understood that he had other priorities. No dejas a ninguno vivo, Murinas yelled. As expected, several Malfori circled around and out of the unlit Donfala stairwell and into the chamber. 
the archers unleashed their hail of sharpened arrows at the massive animals, but this only seemed to enrage them more. Ineffective against the beasts, Eulinea yelled. Archers, target the riders only. Riders only. Aim for the openings in their helms. Swordsmen, focus on slaying the beasts. Strike at the eyes and then the underbelly. Avoid talons. Watch tail swing. Aximen, execute any enemy footman that remains unmounted. Protect our women. Move, Eronu said. Who said anything about needing protection? Ulanea asked. Ulanea sprang into action. She was more of a scholar than a killer, but was not without combat training. As the Renlarai of Shorelane, she was expected to support her husband in matters of state and war. Her command authority was second only to her husband. As first, Soraya of Shorelane, Kelsey had always thought that she would rise to the occasion when faced with the prospect of death. Training had prepared her to defend against weapons with shields and swords, but there was no training involving the preparation of one's nerves. When the arrows began to fly, she shamefully hid behind Sayaronu and then her father. Of course, no one judged her, and to a certain extent, her reaction to the violence in this way was expected, but she had stood there in the hall and watched as men were slaughtered. A woman's shield and sword are useless if not thrown into the fray of combat, and she had not yet gathered the courage to enter it. Ulanea, on the other hand, was the descendant of a long line of proud defenders and had some battle experience to draw from. Legend told the tale of the Parsakuman villages coming under siege by a vicious sea race, armed with weapons forged from bone and coral. The Parsekumans were nearly wiped off the face of the entire island, but the sea goddess Dranesca sympathised with the Parsekuman people and taught them how to survive on the island by crafting weapons using enormous seashells, Nathrakean and Zaffron bone, coral deposits and piezo crystals. The Parsecumans successfully defeated the Waterborne and established a permanent stronghold on the island. During the defence of their capital, Etris, the spear played a crucial role as it was long enough to pierce the much larger Naga with deadly accuracy, but avoid their much shorter coral axes and cone-shaped teeth. The spear was also an excellent tool for the physically weaker female to maintain distance from an opponent capable of cracking vertebrae with a bicep squeeze. Ulanea leaped into battle with recent memories of her friend's demise. Her spear found its target with nearly every thrust. Experience had taught the mighty Ren Lorai to parry sword, thrusts at her midsection, and shift direction from that deflection to catch her opponent off guard with a fatal jab beneath the armpit and into the heart. A still-beating pumper often doused the spearhead with bright, thick gore, fooling any observer into believing that the weapon had always been crimson. The de facto queen was surprised that most men had not devised a defence against the ancient Parsecumen technique, but their lack of adaptation was to her advantage. Gorthrondus's entrance to the chamber from the stairwell caught Ulanea's attention, who immediately recognised him as a director of action. Leaders typically hung back in battle, pointed fingers and shouted orders, and the large brute had demonstrated a tendency to do all three. He ordered his fighters to get as close as they could to archers, or remain behind the beastly Malfori for protection. The Malfori possessed natural talons that could not pierce plate armour, but their immense strength was more than enough to remove humorous bone from the body and the femur from the pelvis. Jaws of the predatory animals crushed armoured skulls and burst abdominal cavities open with crushing bites. As the creatures nipped and gnawed at meat, hanging from dismembered men's ravaged bodies, the forces of Yakvon advanced further into the chamber and pushed Chris's defenders back. Although present, Chris was primarily concerned with the safety of Kelsey. He knew that his wife was a more than capable Salavar 
of the remaining forces. Lord Holsenai was, of course, a competent warrior himself, but like many good leaders before him, he understood the importance of allowing his combatants to do their best without having their toes metaphorically mashed. They all knew that their only path toward victory rested in delay. As such, the mission was not to fight their way out, it was to survive as long as possible. One of the Shore Lane soldiers managed to reach Gorthrondus and received a sweep to the legs for daring to enter the warrior's space. While on his back, the pitiful Shore Lane defender swung and flayed his sword to protect himself against the towering Thalavar, but was unsuccessful. Ulanea watched as her faithful fighter met his end with a vicious, decapitating chop to the space between his helmet and his breastplate. She had decided then and there that this remorseless adversary needed to be taken down quickly with extreme prejudice. At worst, the enemy would be down one man, and at best, they would be less organized without his directing hand. That one, Ulanea pointed to the monstrous murderer. He goes down now, Sa'ironu. He's directing their forces. Kill him. Eronu slowly approached Gorthrondus and looked him in the face as best he could. They were both wearing helmets that hid their faces, but their eyes could still be seen. A predator's visual orbits are situated frontally to improve focus upon a prey, and both men looked ahead at the other's opponent rather than away as a deer might. Gorthrondus took the first mighty swing from his right to left and at Eronu's chest, the skillful axeman was much shorter than his opponent, but muscularly bulky himself. He expertly blocked the attack with the pole of his own weapon and connected his shoulder with the monster's chest, sending him backward. Eronu leaped into the air and raised his battle axe to finish the downed giant with an executioner's strike to his head, but it was the final mistake of the stocky stud. The deceptively fast Gorthrondus was able to roll over to avoid the attack and deliver a deadly axe chop to the unfortunate warrior's backside. Sa'aronu fell to the ground in pain and dropped his precious axe. His helmet was removed, and in either an act of cruelty or an act of mercy, his head was split into halves, with the axe head exposing blood and brains to all combatants distracted by the contest. Witnessing this, Ulania ran toward Gorthrondus with intent to kill. The entrails of eviscerated warriors covered the ground, as did severed appendages and heads. The sight of partially devoured forearms and calves removed from their armor failed to give her pause. An unseasoned combatant might have regurgitated her last meal, given the fetid stench emanating from the sanguine floor, but Ulania, in this moment, was a killing instrument, and not simply the fair Ren Lorai. She could feel the rage boiling within her, but training taught her to maintain discipline and focus. Losing one's composure could lead to bad decisions. Her charge was obstructed by one of the two remaining Malfori. Its breath was nearly enough to repel her, but she was not one to retreat from a challenge. She had tamed the Ren Loris of Lorone after all. The bird-like talons of the animal swiped at her armoured body, but were no match for the protective resilience of Zelite plating. The claws screeching upon metal represented to her ears an otherwise fatal assault to her form. Saber teeth, followed by rows of pulverizing molars, snapped at her fragile head, which remained protected by armour, save for the eyes and mouth regions. Ulania's hand released her spear and she reached out with both hands to resist the crushing forces that she felt upon her skull as the beast clamped down. The power exerted by her hands was insufficient to force the beast away, and the pressure building within her face within its jaws elicited a sense of fear within her for the first time. She decided to apply a lesson learned from a departed friend of hers and withdrew a badoon from her attached satchel. She closed her eyes, held her breath, and shoved the pod deep into the beast's throat while compressing it against its stiff rear. 
highly corrosive acid splashed from the burst pod and disintegrated the insides of the beast, forcing Ulanea's release. She removed her burned gauntlets, thorax plating and helmet to expose the more fragile features of her body, now only covered by cloth. A rapidly dissolving Malfoy head was a welcome sight for the mighty Renlarai. Retrieving the spear from the floor gave her a renewed sense of power, but observing her fallen comrades had a neutralizing effect. To her left, three men were combating the final Malfurus. She looked to the far rear of the chamber to see her husband crossing blades with two swordsmen and his daughter standing behind him. She was confident that Chris could hold his own against such banal fiends. She turned again to face the front and observed Marinas standing before Gorthrondus. Fighting was not about fairness in her mind. No one had asked for the rights of a traditional duel, which meant that standard combat rules should apply. This towering tyrant must be taken down, she thought to herself, and if they had to overwhelm him with superior numbers to do it, she held little qualms about doing so. Navnote kumu, she shouted as she ran over the warriors. Marina swung his weapon's spiked ball at Gorthrondus's head, but the Sasayenga blocked the attack with his own blood-covered axe. He sought to hack into Marinus's lower left abdomen with the head of his weapon, but the superior Zelite armor blunted the sharp edge of the axe, producing a flash of sparks. While not cut, the force behind the attack was enough to knock the wind out of Marinus, and he fell upon his back while still holding his morning star. Gorthrondus assumed that the armor was likely weaker near the neck region and was about to deliver a second chop when he felt a heavy weight bear down upon his back. Excruciating pain followed the weight as Ulanea wrapped her legs around the tyrant from behind, removed her dagger and buried it as deep into the unarmored portion of his shoulder as she could. Twisting the blade within the wound prevented it from closing and sent waves of agony down the left side of Gorthrondus's body. An echoing scream throughout the entire chamber could be heard by all. Gorthrondus dropped his axe, reached behind, and grabbed a fistful of female hair. Ulanea found that her leg hold, combined with her own weight, was not enough to prevent her from being pulled to the giant's front. He wrapped his hands around her throat and attempted to burst her windpipe, but the resilient marinas had risen to his feet. Gathering momentum from the circling morning star provided enough force to blast the skelm's right knee with a well-aimed shot from its chained ball. Forced to release the captured woman, the brute fell to his knees, but had enough time to remove the dagger from his shoulder. His breathing intensified, and he realized that these fighters were atypical. Holding back might mean his defeat. Ulanea quickly recovered her spear and thrust Solokvin's point at the tyrant's face. Despite his injuries, Gorthrondus was able to dodge the attack and recover his own axe. He retreated several feet to his rear, prompting both Ulanea and Marinus to give chase. They both thought it odd that such a large fiend would retreat rather than fight to the death, but their presumptions of withdrawal from the chamber were misplaced. Gorthrondus was not retreating. He was simply moving toward the fallen weapon of Sayeronu. He scooped up the second axe and prepared to face both opponents after catching his second wind. The wounded shoulder and kneecap slowed his typically swift motion with a single axe, but the second cleaver allowed him to respond more effectively against two warriors. Knock Piemanis, he said to them with a deep voice and a smile. Marinus and Ulanea attacked simultaneously with the spiked ball and spear. The giant deflected both attacks and countered with an axe swing at Ulanea, which cut into her unprotected abdomen. She applied pressure to the wound with her hand, but fell to the floor in pain. Her palm revealed the depth of the slice, with bright red blood smeared across it. 
the brave mariners continued to swing at the miscreant, but his swings failed to connect. One of his attacks was caught in a loop around the monster's left axe, and he found himself being yanked into Gorthrandus's space. Unable to pull his morning star back for another swing with his right arm, Marinus withdrew his dagger with his left hand and tried to pierce the villain's throat. A powerful headbutt to Marinus by the significantly larger brute prevented a successful assault, however, and Marinus found himself concussed and virtually unarmed. Gorthrondus removed the helmet of his nearly unconscious opponent and enclosed the head of Marinus within his thick fingers. An evil grin spread across his face as he compressed the smaller man's skull with tremendous force and twisted until the crack of Marinus's cervical vertebrae could be heard. The unfortunate warrior fell to his death on the ground. As a final insult, Gorthrondus spat upon Marinus's dead body and then looked over toward Ulanea with a smile. Tu es nakamais ren lorai, he said. Ulanea closed her eyes again and said a silent prayer to Drenesca, the goddess of her people, and then stood up after finally catching her breath. She removed the remaining pieces of her armor to increase her agility and then grabbed Solakvin with her bloody right hand. Having memories of Haz, Eronu, and Murinas near the surface of her mind, she let out an instinctive battle cry as she charged the merciless demon of a man. The woman thrusted her blade at his chest with her weapon, but the armored ogre was protected by dense plating. She swung the spear again, and the steel blade struck his right pauldron, but caused little damage. The clang of metal against metal rang many times as her study Solak vein found its target, but was unable to penetrate his coverings and reach his flesh. Each swing and thrust was accompanied by a ki burst from her mouth, evoking the spirit of Riku for strength. As the flailing continued, she grew tired, but Gorthrondus's motion also decreased in energy. He too was losing blood from the shoulder wound inflicted earlier, and was unable to land a blow on the nimble Renlori. As his body began to fatigue, he began to realize that his end was near, and despite her injuries, Ulanea would not relent on her attack until one of them was dead. Ulanea struck his armored legging for probably the twentieth time before pausing. In that moment, Gorthrandus could also catch his breath and raise his two axes in a defensive position. Ulanea uttered the words, Drenesca's Varetu Mani Pasagat. Solakvene began to change shape in response, and its spearhead began to resemble fresh embers at the base of a roaring fire. The blade itself was now red as Iodva herself, and elongated to a length equal to the pole handle. Gorthrondus swung with his left axe, but, to his horror, found a cauterized stump attached to his body before he finished the motion. His severed hand continued to grip the once-prized weapon of Sayeronu and remained twitching on the floor. The giant yelled more out of anger than out of pain and attempted to split the unarmored lady in two with his remaining axe. However, he soon saw his right arm falling to the ground having been separated from his once mighty shoulder. The heat from the glowing spearhead only seemed to intensify with each strike from an enraged Ulanea and instantly seared the blood vessels of the armless brute. Sasayenga! Ulanea's final swing sundered Gorthrondus's already injured kneecap, and the once tall warrior fell to his back for probably the last time. As she observed his spasming severed limbs, Ulanea had a fleeting thought to allow this poor creature to live as an invalid. Did he even deserve death? Might it not be more suitable for him to suffer his remaining days in dependence on others once weaker than himself? Listening to the taunts of cruel children and being the subject of jokes and ridicule until the end? She looked over at the quickly dimming Solokvin and realized she had to decide within seconds 
while she still held the armor-piercing power of Dranesca in her hands. Ulanea raised Solokveen high above his armored chest and quickly drove the spearhead into the now ineffectual breastplate. Its carmine tip melted through steel, burned through flesh and split muscle to inevitably pierce the giant's heart. The scorching edge ran through his beating organ and deep into the stone floor beneath him as she stared into his eyes. Life escaped his body, and she was surprised to find words of blessing exit her lips as she bid farewell to the homicidal fiend. Despite your actions, I hope that Kenru and the gods forgive you. Rest in peace, monster. She removed her spear and fell to the ground in exhaustion. Ulanea realized that she was lying in a puddle of blood, which she found to be revolting, but her feelings of disgust were replaced with sorrow once she realized that the blood was her own. It seemed as if the towering brute had gotten the last laugh after all. The wound in her abdomen would not close, and she felt herself drifting slowly off into another realm. She felt an arm wrap around her neck and pull her upright. Pressure upon her wound increased, and she felt herself being embraced by an armored form. For a moment, she thought she could even hear her daughter's voice urging her to fight for her life. It sounded so real, but it was a vague vision of a former existence. She loved her daughter Kelsey and her dear husband Chris. He could handle things from now on, couldn't he? The slayings of her friends had all been avenged by her own hands and efforts. While her spear did not protect them from death, Hasnaron, Saironu and Murinas could all rest in peace thanks to her relentless commitment to duty. Ulanea heard a familiar, ethereal voice speak to her as the pain within her midsection began to rapidly fade away. Your journey within Ereshma has met its end. You can let go now if you want, Ulanea. You've nothing to fear here. Come home, my child. Ulanea stood up and surrounded herself by the most beautiful realm she had ever witnessed. Cool grass supported her bare feet. A thin peplose replaced her bloody clothes, and reaching up to her head revealed perfectly kept hair that flowed down to the small of her back. She looked up to observe colorful trees with tops that seemed to stretch upward into an eternal night sky. The familiar and aromatic scent of pine seemed to dominate this world, which was overflowing with pultritude. Humungus Luzerala danced across the landscape as orbs of lights hovered in Ulanea's vicinity to welcome her. Although the orbs did not have a human form, she instantly knew that they were the souls of her friends, Haz, Eronu, and Merinas. They did not speak, but she understood their thoughts as if they had the source of the familiar voice stepped out from amongst the beautiful trees. Welcome back, Ulanea. We've all missed you so much. Ulanea couldn't believe her eyes. She smiled as tears seemed to pour out from her apparent human form in this word of pure energy and spirit. Although she didn't have to say a word, she uttered the only thing that seemed appropriate to say at that moment. Um. Mother, 